So glucocorticoids, which is the same thing as saying 17 hydroxy steroids, which is the same thing as saying the production of the zona fasciculata, are stress hormones. And basically, the capacity to withstand stress is based on a lot of the things with glucocorticoids. Now, glucocorticoids have the ability to raise glucose, raise free fatty acids. Stress hormones all mobilize energy stores. Energy store means glycogen from the liver. Mm, look at that biochemistry section and take triglycerides out of storage and put them in as free fatty acids. So growth hormone does the same thing in terms of mobilizing fatty acids and mobilizing glucose. So there are actually four stress hormone systems. The four stress hormone systems of growth hormone, glucagon, catecholamines, and cortisol all have the same thing in terms of raising glucose, they all raise glucose, they all raise free fatty acids. They all cause more ketones, they all break down glycogen, they all increase glucose, they all cause gluconeogenesis, they all do that. The biggest difference between the stress hormones is actually their effect on proteins. That's the single biggest difference between the stress hormones, their effect on proteins, the protein effect. But in terms of them raising glucose, breaking down glycogen, breaking down fats and forming free fatty acids, increasing ketones is the same. Cortisol is the product of the fasciculata, is the only 17-hydroxy steroid is the only feedback inhibition on the pituitary, is under the control of ACTH. It raises glucose, breaks down glycogen. But what is the major method of it raising glucose? It's not gluconeogenesis. That's the most common wrong answer. The major effect of it raising glucose is blocking the peripheral uptake in tissues. Blocks the uptake into lipid cells, into fat cells, and into lymph, and even into muscle. Well, if you're blocking the uptake into peripheral tissues, what are you shaving all that sugar for, sugar? And the answer is the brain. Now, the biggest difference between the stress hormones is their effect on protein. Cortisol breaks down protein. Cortisol degrades proteins so that the protein can be converted into precursors for gluconeogenesis. And when you break down protein from the bone, bone is calcified protein, it makes it for gluconeogenesis. When you break down the skin and you get stria and bruising, it's to take the protein out of the skin and use it for gluconeogenesis. When you break down the bone, the skin, the bruising, so you can use it for gluconeogenesis. You get hyperlipidemia because it promotes lipolysis. Now, our book is very big on saying the same thing in several different ways, so don't get fooled when we say it increases lipolysis and it decreases lipogenesis because if you're breaking down lipids in storage, you're not forming lipids in storage. It's the same thing as increasing ketone. So I just said the same thing in three different ways. Isn't that interesting? I'm forming, I'm causing lipolysis. I'm breaking down lipids. I'm forming ketones. The same way if I'm breaking down proteins for gluconeogenesis, I'm also creating urea. Urea. Protein poo-poo is urea. Lipid poo-poo is ketones. Carbohydrates go up. We're raising the glucose. And the major thing is, is it's being made available for the brain. So cortisol blocks the effect of insulin in most tissues. Cortisol is a direct anti-insulin. Cortisol is a direct anti-insulin. Cortisol is a direct anti-insulin in most tissues. So everything I just said about cortisol, the exact opposite is true with insulin. Cortisol also makes you have glucose from gluconeogenesis by taking proteins and converting them into amino acids so the amino acids can be used to make sugar. Let's go back to the terms permissive actions. 
Permissive action means it doesn't do it directly, but it enhances something. It enhances the capacity of glucagon and catecholamines. It enhances the capacity of glucagon to break down glycogen in the liver. As a matter of fact, cortisol's major activity in the liver is through enhancing the effect of glucagon. Glucagon means to bring back glucose. It causes the liver to break down glycogen. So you've got to think about glycogen as like the loaf of bread in your kitchen. You know, it doesn't last forever. It lasts for one day. goes stale. So it's not for feed you for a day. It causes, um, uh, that's why people carb load uh, when they're going to go run marathons. They load up with glycogen and it lasts for a while. It's good. Um, and it's also relatively clean because it doesn't make the ketones you get out of fat. Becoming ketogenic is difficult, more difficult than breaking down glycogen. So there is lipolysis, which is to say decreasing lipogenesis, and it's the same thing as saying forms ketones. Now, catecholamines right, also break down glycogen, and so it does with both alpha and beta, and the beta receptor function also helps regulate glucose. That's a little overblown, exaggerated. But catecholamines also raise sugar. Remember, the single greatest difference between these is their effect on proteins. Catecholamines have no protein effect. Catecholamines don't touch proteins. Glucagon doesn't break down protein. Glucagon takes an amino acid. doesn't break down a protein. But if there's an amino acid going to form a protein, We'll take that amino acid and use it to make sugar instead. So it's not that it's destroying protein. It's just preventing it from being built. So that's not the same thing as destruction. Catecholamines have no protein effect. Cortisol breaks down proteins to turn it into sugar. That's why you get bruising, osteoporosis, and steroid myopathy. That's a very good question for steroids. Why do you get steroid myopathy? Why do steroids break down proteins? Because it turns them into sugar for steroid myopathy. Let's take a look and see how things come down from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamic CRH, which is corticotropin releasing hormone, it goes down to the anterior pituitary and makes pro-opio-melanocortin. Now, pro-opio melanocortin is more precise than just saying ACTH because pro-opio melanocortin is what the precursor of ACTH. It's also why it is that under stress or when people exercise or they run, they go looking for those endorphins that go from the pro-opio melanocortin. Now, we don't know the precise function of melanocyte stimulating hormone as a stress hormone moment to moment. We just know it's part of it. We do know that when people have Addison's disease, and they have um, a decrease in adrenal hormones Why you get hyperpigmentation. This is why President Kennedy had a kind of a permanent tan, because he had Addison's disease from melanocyte-stimulating hormone. Now, this is also part of the reason that we have circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are a very complicated mechanism coming out of light perception, melatonin, and you get some perception of light through your eyes that has a complicated interaction with corticotropin releasing hormone and melanin, melatonin. But it is part of the reason that you have circadian rhythms and can get up out of bed and why it is that you continue to get up at early in the morning on Saturday and Sunday even when you don't need to be in medical school or the hospital. It peaks early in the morning because we want the sugars to go up early in the morning to get you out of bed. So you get breakfast in bed out of your head. Every morning, a half an hour before you get up, you get a little ding, 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 and you get corticotropin-releasing hormone to ACTH to cortisol. Cortisol raises sugar and raises free fatty acids and helps you get up and go. And that's also why late in the evening we don't want that because we want you to be able to get to sleep. Corticotropin-releasing hormone is a stress hormone. Greatest in the morning, peak of the morning, and that's also why a high evening cortisol is consistent with Cushing's disease. That's why doing a 24-hour urine cortisol is the average 
and helps us to know if you've got hypercortisolism. But a late night salivary cortisol. You can actually do it yourself at home in the saliva. A late night salivary cortisol that's low is normal. Late night salivary cortisol that's high is abnormal because it should be lowest in the evening so you can go to sleep. And also, a normal person should suppress in response to giving dexamethasone at night. A normal person should suppress in response to giving dexamethasone at night. So that's why this is the basis of the several tests for do you have hypercortisolism? Do you have hypercortisolism? That's what you could tell it by saying, ooh, 24-hour urine cortisol, late-night salivary cortisol, one milligram overnight dexamethasone. These are all three different ways to test to see, do you have hypercortisolism? If you can't suppress the morning cortisol, it's hypercortisolism. If you have a high late-night salivary cortisol, it's hypercortisolism. The morning blood sugar should be the greatest. Well, let me ask you, when should the body temperature be lowest in the day? In the 24-hour cycle, when should your body temperature be lowest? It should be lowest in the morning. Because in the morning is when the body temperature should be lowest because that's when the cortisol is greatest. Cortisol lowers body temperature. Adrenocorticotropin hormone, ACTH, stimulates cortisol and the adrenal androgens. And cortisol should suppress this by being the only feedback inhibition. Now, when you have high ACTH, this is one of the first tests to do to tell you the location of your hypercortisolism. Now, hypercortisolism tests are very complicated, so that's why I'm going to say them several times. 24-hour urine cortisol, 1 milligram overnight dexamethasone, and late-night salivary cortisol help you to know do you have hypercortisolism or not? But they will not tell you the location of your hypercortisolism. In order to know the location, you have to do things like ACTH levels. A high ACTH means it's either from the pituitary or from some ectopic production. High ACTH means it's a pituitary or ectopic production. And along with ACTH from the pituitary, comes darkening of the skin with melanocyte-stimulating hormone. What is the function of beta-lipotropin? Man, I don't know. You go figure it out and get a Nobel Prize and let me know, okay? Don't forget to email me when you find out. I don't know. It's a precursor of beta-melanocyte-stimulating hormone and the endorphins. Why the lipotropin? Well, you could say the point of it is the endorphins. Okay, I accept that. Why do you have the MSH on top of it? I don't know. Endorphins definitely modulate pain. They give you runner's high. They help you to withstand pain under conditions of stress, which is an awfully good thing, don't you think?